Hello again, dear ones, it's Jen Harris here for a 10 minute take. Now, something that came across my desk early this afternoon, late this evening, and I was really ruminating as to whether or not I want to speak on it. And that is the Netflix soon to be series program special, The Babysitter's Club. Now, those of you who may be unfamiliar, the Babysitter's Club is actually a YA serial that was created by Anne and Martin. And I myself grew up reading these books when I was about eh, between 10 and about 14 years old. When I was about 14, I transitioned from reading Babysitter's Club books to reading uh, more, I guess you can call it adult or dark fiction. You know, uh, I found I found Anne Rice and that was, pre that was pretty much all she wrote. But... With that, with that being said, that and Arl Stein, and uh, also one of my childhood favorites is Christopher Pike. Shameless plug, read anything Christopher Pike. He's amazing. Uh, but the one thing that really disturbed me about this uh, revamp or rebooting of the Baby Series Club is this photo. Now, in this photo, for those of you who may not, again, be familiar with this, with this. Um, with this series is uh, in this picture, it seems that one girl who was also integral in this book, she's missing. Now, a little backstory. My sister and I grew up, grew up reading, the, reading, reading this series. So I have a pretty good handle on the backstory. The backstory of the Babysitter's Club starts with this young lady named Christy, Kristen Thomas, who is the daughter of a single mom. I believe her mom is divorced or her dad just ran out on her. And her, her and her mom and her brother and her mother is like calling all over her small town of Stony Brook, Connecticut, trying to find a babysitter for her brother. So Christy thinks, hey, what if there was just one number you called and you could get in contact with, uh, with people who you could then have to watch your kid. So, you know, one stop shopping, you know, you call, you know, this is the day at this, is, and you know, I need sitting for tonight or a week from now. Can you watch my baby? Bam, this would be the rate. This is gonna come over. Bam, awesome. So from there, you have Christy, her friend, Marianne, her best friend, Marianne, their friend, Claudia, their friend, Stacy, and another girl, Dawn, and a girl, Dawn, Mallory, and Jesse. So how the books are constructed is every book builds upon another. So if you hadn't read the first book, you would have no idea how the Babysitter's Club came to be. And if you had no idea how the Babysitter's Club came to be, you would have no idea on how these, uh, this particular series is going to run. So the genius of what Anne and Martin did was she made these girls very relatable, very tangible, and very realized as much as you know, middle school kids can be realized. But the cool thing about this particular series is the invention of uh, one character called Jesse Jessica Davis Ramsey. Jessica Davis Ramsey was black. She moved with her family, her family, uh, including her mother, her married mother and father, her younger brother, uh, John, and um, her little sister, Rebecca. They moved, they moved from Jersey, they moved to Stony Brook, Connecticut, and Jesse is a ballerina. Now that, to me, with knowing that information going in before I even saw this photo, it, it, I couldn't help but think of and draw parallels to the dynamic and legendary Misty Copeland, who, had, who probably at the time these books were being published was just learning how to dance on point. And Jesse in the book dances on point, which is one of the hardest things in dance to do. So when I saw this picture, I had my heart broke because again, here we go with the casual casual erasure, erasure of black characters, the casual erasure of black women and girls from media, from literature, even if it is YA. The thing that makes this um, that much more irritating is that it continues to be pervasive in the culture. As I continue to say, and I mean this when I say it, that erasure is a viral social ill. And it goes back to 
Who owns language? Who owns a narrative? Who is allowed to tell which story? And why are these stories, and why are some stories more, more acceptable and more palatable than other stories? Who makes these rules? Which then goes back to the, to the decolonization of language and who owns language? The dynamic Toni Morrison said that, you know, we die, that, that we die, that's what we do. But language may be the measure of our lives. So most of her work was around decolonize, decolonizing the canon, as she called it. And again, I can applaud Anne M. Martin for what she tried to do through this series. In this series, you, we deal with divorce, we deal with death, we deal with bullying, we deal with xenophobia. There's even a young girl that Christy takes care of who has autism. Um, you have, you have again Jesse, learning uh, American Sign Language to take care of one of the one of her charges who happens to be deaf. You have uh, Stacy who is, you know, who also her her parents are divorced, and she's a type one diabetic. So you have you have this believable hodgepodge of these girls being thrown together by by time and by time and chance who are doing something that that most most kids mainly girls as sexist as it is that they do babysit you have this you have this feeling of um entrepreneur this feeling of entrepreneurship this feeling of camaraderie and inclusivity. They never, and the great thing is they never make Jesse feel like she's the token black girl, which I always liked. And what I always liked also is that the fact Mallory and Jesse in the books are best friends. So I really want to know how Netflix is going to recreate that. Now I understand that, you know, some artistic licensure is, is to be done in matters of uh, adapting a book. I get that. You know, because, you know, for those of you who have, who have ever or never read Harry Potter, Voldemort's eyes are actually red. In the movie, they're not red. So those, you know, so, but that's a small idiosyncrasy that you would notice if you had never read, if you had read the books and then saw the movie. But the thing that is so disconcerting when things like this happen, especially with black characters, it... It gives it gives me pause. It gives me pause as woman and writer because it it feels like I am haunt a ghost haunting a house. There are people in this space that I once inhabited that I still inhabit in some form, but because I am not acknowledged, I then have to set about making my presence known however I see fit. So because I am a writer and because I am at the intersection of the intersection of black and woman and writer and mother and content creator, I am able to say, to say in this space, take, taking a deep breath and saying, where is Jesse? Why can't Jesse be here already? I personally don't think Netflix is going to add Jesse to this, to this cast, but I really don't. Again, in the picture I just showed you, which again, I got from Entertainment Weekly, I don't believe that they're going to add her because once more, yet again, and still, if the black girl is a problem, problem meaning not economically profitable or could be hazardous to our ratings, we can't include her. As Jesse, as Jesse was written as an 11, 12 year old black girl, Ann M. Martin does not know what it's like to be an 11, 12 year old black girl in a, in a predominantly white town for one. Two, and for two, she doesn't know what that's like to be a black girl in America, period. But I can applaud her effort. I can applaud the fact that she saw fit to give to give black girls a space in this in this sea of um, of white girls, it's just like the teacher who petitioned Charles M. Schultz after uh, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated to include something in the peanuts care in the peanuts strip 
that will reflect the changing time. And then from that plea of that one teacher, he came up with Franklin. So I understand we do the best we can with what we have as long as we have, as long as we have to, but the erasure of black women and girls in media, in media and in books has to stop. If you're, if you're going to rail about black Jedis and keep into the source material and be mad that Tom Holland has like two black girls and two majorly successful movies, if you're gonna rail about that and think this is okay, you have a bigger problem. My imagination can compensate for the for the Marvel comic universe, well, the Marvel comic universe and the Marvel Cinematic Universe taking its license. It can it can accommodate um, vampires not sparkling because the vampires I grew up liking they didn't sparkle. If my imagination can accommodate that, then on some end, the world is going to have to bend toward the black girls who read books also. We'd like to see us on pages too, and not as a token. The erasure has got to stop.